Well, hey, and welcome back. First of all, a quick explanation for this video. One thing that I've touched on before is that a thing that I really do try to do when I shoot these videos is make sure to capture good video. The stuff that the camera captures, which I can then edit down into a concise 15, 20 minute block. I really do try my best to make it look at least usable. And the image that you see these days is a years long process of trial and error, swapping in different lighting rigs, lenses, and in my opinion, it is leagues better than what it used to be. Now, despite this video being about cameras and lenses, truly the most important thing in a shot is the lighting. If the lighting is off, you really are gonna struggle, even with the most expensive cinema cameras and lenses. Which is why when I'm shooting just this normal looking shot, I usually have this light here, plus, one, two, three, four, five, and six, plus the two standard workshop lights. In total, that is nine different lights doing different things to light up different parts of the lathe to get you this shot. And it may seem like overkill, but this is really what is needed, considering that the workshop is not that good for light, and I do so much of this at night, and I bet you can never tell the difference when it's daytime and nighttime. With all that said though, the camera does matter, at least a bit. Now look, this is not intended to be a my history of cameras ever because we have to start all the way back at my mini DV tape camera and go all the way to the few times that I've shot on an Arri Alexa. But I do think it's worth mentioning this one because this is a very special camera to me. This is a Canon 600D. It's probably 13 years old by now and it's still a fairly capable camera. I probably had it close to eight years now. I bought this one secondhand with a few lenses and it was my first big purchase with my first paycheck that I got from delivering pieces. And most importantly, I used this on my first early YouTube channels and it's also what I used in the first 20 or 30 projects on this channel. And to sum it up, nice camera, no autofocus in video mode and terrible battery life. It was only good for about 30 minutes of video, which was not great for filming. These days though, I run a Canon 80D, much nicer, more capable rig, by no means is it a cinema camera, but for what I need here, it is more than capable. Importantly for me though, I was able to use my old lenses on this camera because they use the same mount. This is what is known as an EF or an EFS mount. And up until about five years ago, that was the common standard lens mount that you get on all Canon cameras. And most importantly, pretty much all of my lenses use this mount and I'm able to swap them in and out. 99% of what you see on the channel is shot on this lens. It's the Canon 18 to 135. Very capable lens, good all rounder. But when I use the angle grinder or the bench grinder, I usually swap it out to this. If you know your lenses, you'll know that this is a cheapo kit lens that comes with the camera. They're plastic, but they get the job done. And when I'm throwing grit at the camera, I'd much rather break one of these lenses. Which I have. The grit has killed the autofocus motor in two of these lenses, and replacing one of these lenses is a lot cheaper because it only costs about 50 bucks to pick up one of these compared to four or 500 bucks to get one of the other lenses. Anyway, let's talk about the other camera for a moment. What I have here is one of my other cameras. It's a late 1970s film camera, which I occasionally use to shoot 35 millimeter film, which I then develop. Nice camera and all, but it does use a different lens mount compared to the Canon. And it would be different whether it was a vintage Canon or a modern Canon. Now the exact mount is known as an M42 mount, and it pretty much is what it says. It's an M42 thread with a 1mm pitch, which is a really simple camera mount to design for. I mean, I cut threads on the lathe all the time. And really what I want to be able to do is use it and my other vintage M42 lenses on my Canon 80D. Maybe not for the workshop stuff or stuff that I do on YouTube, but just stuff in general. Now there's quite a few reasons why you'd want to use vintage lenses, but to really simplify it, they produce a different type of image, the colours are different, it's generally a bit softer and more unique to the time period. And I really would like to play around with these lenses. It's one of the few ways that you can get an actual vintage look, short of shooting on actual celluloid film, and if I tried to do that, it would probably bankrupt me after the first minute. It also helps that the lenses are also quite a bit cheaper. You can pick up a vintage lens for one or two hundred bucks and get a really good image compared to having to spend hundreds or even thousands of dollars for a modern lens. I am going to lose autofocusing, but it's still pretty tempting. The only thing really holding me back is the different mounts. What I need is an adapter. And the good thing is they exist, which means this should work. And on face value, they're not that expensive. They're about 60 bucks all in. 
But really, what's the point of having a workshop and a lathe and a mill if I just go ahead and buy everything? If I did that, I'd have nothing to make. The only difficulty that I can see is making the correct pattern and getting the spacing exactly on dimension. The lens needs to be a specific distance from the sensor to properly focus, and that distance is different from the standard lens. Now the distance, or in this case the difference, is known as the flange focal distance, and it is a pretty tricky and careful mathematical equation that can only be solved by a quick Google search. In this case, it is 1.46mm, so the flange needs to be 1.46mm thick. Now to make it, I have some aluminium round bar, which will be more than suitable for the adapter ring. Tons of camera stuff is made from aluminium, and if they can make a plastic lens work, aluminium will definitely work. So the first thing that we'll do is clean up that piece of aluminium. Now the camera adapter, when it's all said and done, is only going to be 7.5mm wide and it has features on both sides that need to be machined. So the order of operations is going to be really important to get this thing done. So the first thing that I'll do is I'll take it down to the OD of the main flange, which will be roughly 72mm. Now it should be said that whilst the inserts that I'm using here are a general turning insert, they're not really meant for aluminium, and the 6061 that I'm using here is a pretty gummy and sticky alloy. The cutting edge very quickly gets a build up of aluminium. With that said though, if you really do push these inserts, the chip breaker starts to work pretty well. With the flange OD now done, I'll turn a step down for the mount that will lock into the camera. With that now done, it now needs a groove cut in it for the camera to lock into. And this is pretty tight tolerance and there's not a whole lot of room to work with. And that is the groove now cut, which is pretty groovy. We now need to start boring the center out. However, we can't take it to the full ID for the thread diameter. And the reason for that is because this is an old non-powered lens. There needs to be a lip, which is exactly one millimeter thick on the inside. And what it does is it compresses a pin on the back side of the lens as we screw it in. And the job of the pin is to close the aperture of the lens, which focuses the light. Without it, we'd have a very shallow depth of field, which would be very difficult to focus. So I'll only bore it to 35mm instead of the usual 40 and then we'll have to come in from the other side to finish it off. So I'll start off with a drill and then follow it up with an end mill and then bore it to 35mm. and then I can part it. 
Actually, before I finish parting it, it's probably better if I do all the mill work first, whilst I still have the ability to hold onto the large piece of stock at the back. Now the main thing that I need to do is make the flange into three interrupted flanges, which can then lock into the camera body. And whilst at a moment like this, it would be really nice to have a four axis CNC to do it, I can make it work with a dividing head and a bit of mucking around. All right, and there we go. Unfortunately, there is one small mistake there, but the main shape is correct, and that is really what we need. The second thing that we need is to drill a hole for the locking pin. This will match up with a pin in the camera, and it will lock the lens in place. With all that now done, I can then get it parted off. Alright, and I think that turned out looking pretty good. With that said, it still needs a lot more work to get it into a usable state. So I'll get it mounted in the chuck, face it off, and then board the inside for the internal thread, leaving about 1mm unmachined for the flange. I'll then turn a gutter for the threads. Finally, I'll then come in and then single point cut the threads. Now unfortunately, I don't have a left-handed cutting tool for cutting threads, so I can't cut the threads in reverse which means I literally have less than 2mm which to disengage the half nut or the cutting tool is going to crash into the back of the flange and probably break the part. So, fingers crossed. Alright, and look at that. It fits. Pretty happy with how that's turned out. The final thing left to do is take the flange down so that it's only 1.46mm thick. And once that's done, I'll then take the outside down a little bit more. And the reason for that is that the aperture adjusting ring was binding on the flange. As you can probably see, that was about as thin as I could possibly make it. Nothing left to do but see if it works. Alright, that screws on pretty nicely, and most importantly, the aperture closes too. So it looks like we got the spacing for the aperture pin correct. And just like a normal lens, it goes in, snaps into place, and then locks. It feels pretty sturdy, and there's pretty much no movement in it at all. My only wish is that the markings were aligned with the top of the camera, instead of being off by about 25 or 30 degrees. With that said though, in order to do that, it would have required several custom jigs to be able to cut the flange pattern after cutting the threads. Not an impossible thing to do, but a lot more involved. Most importantly though, let's see if it works. Now the lens that I'm using here is hardly a cinema lens and it's probably a bit too soft for the workshop. But you can probably see the difference in the sharpness, the light and the colour compared to the more modern lenses that I normally use. It's definitely a very different type of look and I'm not about to say if it's better or worse, it's just different. 
although it's probably not correct for shooting the type of content that I'm trying to shoot for this YouTube channel. With that said though, I do love the outdoor performance of this lens. It's softer, it captures the light differently, and it's a very unique look. And it's not one that I can capture with the normal lenses that I usually use. And this is the look that I'm getting straight out of the camera. No color grading and no filters. But once I start to play around with grading and colors, I think we can get some really cool looking video out of it. Something different, something unique, a look that you don't get very often on YouTube. Anyway, I'll play around with this in my own spare time and hopefully pick up a few more M42 lenses. I'm looking at getting some anamorphic lenses which would capture some great looking shots, but that's neither here nor there and it may not even work for a workshop setting. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and this project and the quick look behind the camera, sort of, so to speak. In total, it was about five bucks worth of aluminium, which is easy and cheap, if you don't count the lathe and the mill and the dividing head. Thanks for watching. See you next week.